So we have a presidential election going on, and, and I think this is evidence of what I'm about to talk to you about. And in this presidential election, it seems pretty clear that it's about tapping in to the anger and fear and frustration that people have and finding villains. And if you're Donald Trump, the villains are China and Mexico and whoever else has taken our jobs. And if you're Bernie Sanders or Hillary Clinton, the villains are Wall Street billionaires and greedy corporations. And I would suggest to you that the problem is a little bit different than that, that in fact there, there aren't any villains. And it's, a, and it's a little bit more of a difficult situation than we're in than just trying to identify the villains. So overriding theme is the uh, pressure on the middle class, which is in fact real. Since 2007 to 2014, there has been no growth in the number of middle income, middle class households in this country. Yes, we've come back from the Great Recession, but 2007 to 2014, seven years, no growth at all. More recent studies, Pew Research and the University of California, Berkeley, yes, I read research from the University of California, Berkeley, would tell you that in the, in, from 2010 to 2014, in the 229 largest metropolitan areas, the middle class, the percentage of adults living in middle class households has shrunk in 203 of those 229 households, anywhere from 4 to 6 percent. Now, yes, in some of those metro areas, they're defining it as 42,000 to 125,000 household income. Yes, some people have gone up, right? But in most cases, it's people falling out, right? Now, Ernest Hemingway's The Sun Also Rises, a character is asked, how did you go bankrupt? And he answers two ways, gradually and then suddenly. And I would say to you that I think that the gradual forces of globalization and technology have led us to the suddenly of Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders. And when you look into this data of the pressure and the shrinking of the middle class, what you find is it is particularly acute for people who do not have the advantages of advanced education and advanced skills. So the traditional blue collar path to the middle class is particularly getting crushed because of those two forces. Let's talk about those for a minute. Globalization didn't happen by accident, right? Happened on purpose. How we, how we beat communism, how we won the Cold War. Good for the world, good for America as the world's policeman, great for the American consumer, for American companies, winners and losers, for the American worker, mostly losers. But if I say to you, in 1994 we signed NAFTA, in 2000 we normalized trade relations with China on a permanent basis, and in 2001, they were admitted to the World Trade Organization. Let's look at the last 20 years. From 1995, manufacturing employment in this country is down 29%. We're down 4.5 million manufacturing jobs. But is it all globalization? When was the golden age of American manufacturing? First quarter 2016. Manufacturing output adjusted for inflation is back to its peak and has steadily increased from 1995 down in the Great Recession back up to where it was with four and a half million less workers. So there's something else going on here and that something else is automation and technology. So as much as Donald Trump would like to, or Bernie Sanders, or anybody else, I'm going to bring our manufacturing jobs back. No. You might bring manufacturing back, but you're not bringing the manufacturing jobs back because they're being automated away. Since 2010, more recent data, since 2010, manufacturing output in this country is up 20%. But manufacturing employment is only up 5%. So manufacturing as a traditional blue collar path to the middle class is going away because of automation and technology. We do a particularly poor job of getting our heads as humans around the impact 
of exponential increases. A dollar grows to a trillion dollars in just 40 doubles. The first double adds a buck. The 40th double adds half a trillion. The 41st double is a trillion. 1965, Gordon Moore first proposed Moore's Law, that the power of a computer chip would double every two years with no increase in cost. 1965, that's been 50 years. We've now had 25 doubles. As the doubles come now, they're more and more massive. 2015, they had a little party in Silicon Valley to celebrate the 50th anniversary of Moore's Law. And the current CEO of Intel compared Intel's first chip in 1971 to today's Intel chip. And to make the analogy, he used a Volkswagen Beetle. And if the 1971 Volkswagen Beetle had improved the way the computer chip has, today's Volkswagen Beetle would go 300 miles an hour, it would get a million miles to the gallon, and it would cost four cents. Now, there's a lot of debate about whether or not Moore's Law is going to continue, but if it continues for just one more double, you're at 600 miles an hour, two million miles to the gallon, and two cents. I used to say, if you're a highly skilled worker, technology is your tool. If you're a low-skilled worker, technology is your replacement. I now have to be careful about saying that because there's something called Moravec's paradox. Right? I don't know who Moravec is, but I read about this. And it turns out that automation is wonderful, right, for precise, repetitive motion. And it also turns out that for reasoning and analytics, it takes far less computing power than they thought. What really takes a lot of computing power is imprecise motion, right? So your janitor and your busboy and your gardener, they're fine, but your stockbroker and your accountants, they got problems. Before I joined the restaurant industry, I practiced law. And the law firm I practiced with announced two weeks ago that they had hired, bought, whatever you want to call it, IBM's artificial intelligence program for attorneys called Ross. It's a derivative of Watson. And they bought it for their bankruptcy practice. And you tell them the problem, and it will go search all available statutes and case law, analyze them, determine the most relevant, give them to you, give you recommendations, continually monitor it 24 7. Now we're putting young lawyers out of work with technology. Okay? I'm not sure where we're. Yeah, right. Yeah, okay. But, but, it won't, but it won't just be lawyers, I understand that. And then we've got other problems, right? Our industry traditionally has hired young people. How important is it that young people get their first start, get a job? 16 to 19 year olds, from 1995 to 2015, the percentage, this is any kind of job, part-time, right? Seasonally adjusted. The percentage of 16 to 19 year olds with any kind of job has decreased from 55% to 35%. Now that's percentages, what about absolute numbers? Absolute numbers, you've gone from 6.4 in 1995 up to a peak of 7.3 in 2000, down to 4.8 today. So for whatever reason, young people are no longer entering the workforce and getting those critical early skills. So what are we really trying to do here? Are we just trying to talk about minimum wage, whatever? The, the, the real problem facing this country, right, is we are no longer generating the number of head of household income jobs that are needed, particularly for those people without advanced degrees or advanced skills. So they are forced to take entry-level jobs when they need head of household income jobs. So what does government do in response? Government tries to magically transform, through mandates, those entry-level jobs into head of household income jobs. You can see this happening all whenever the New York Times writes about this stuff. They always find some woman who works at McDonald's, and they interview her, and she says, you know, I work at McDonald's, I make $9 and change an hour, and, you know, I get 30 hours a week or 29 hours a week, and there's no way I can support myself and my two kids on that. And she's right, she can't. I mean, God bless her, she's trying, right? And she needs help, but she needs a head of household income job. And she doesn't have the skills to get it. So as government tries to come in and transform that job 
into a head of household income job, it's inadvertently going to destroy those jobs, right? Working the cash register at McDonald's has never been a job to support a family. It never will be. The math doesn't work. Now, when I talk to legislators or I talk to even business people, I'm astounded by how much people don't know about the differences in profitability between industries. All right? So I'll ask them, who makes more money? Wells Fargo, McDonald's, whatever. You know, doesn't, no matter what answer they give me, I then ask, is it close? And they all say, yes, it's close. They have a binary view of business. There's big business, and they all make a lot of money, and there's small business, and they don't. And they, deter they think, if, the more I see your brand, that must be an indication of how much money you make. Right? Now, the other problem is politics is the, is the use of rhetoric to obscure mathematics. Right? And, and mathematics is what sobers you up when you're drunk on good intentions. So here's some real math. In 2014, we'll have 2015 numbers next week for you. 2014, Apple made $39 billion, Exxon Mobil 32, Wells Fargo 23. How do you think Walmart does compared to those guys? Walmart makes $16 billion, less than half of what Apple makes. The SEIU continually refers to McDonald's as America's one, one of America's richest corporations. It is not. They only make four, $5 billion. Well, $5 billion is a lot, yes. It's also one-eighth. Is my math right? It's one, Apple makes eight times what McDonald's makes. Starbucks, $4 cups of coffee on every street corner, $2 billion. Darden, largest casual dining company, $300 million. When you look at it on a per employee basis, Apple made that 39 billion with 97,000 employees. They have an annual profit per employee of $400,000. ExxonMobil, $389,000. There's a third company that made 36 billion, but they needed 5.8 million employees to do it, so their profit per employee is only $6,300. We'll send you all these slides. You don't need to know. Pictures up, don't worry about it. $6,300. Now, profit per employee is basically gives, measures two things. The first is how much government imposed pain you can absorb, because most government imposed pain comes in the form of an increased cost on a per employee basis. So your profit per employee is the measure of how much pain you could accept. And the second thing it measures is how good a communist you are. Right? Because Karl Marx said the problem with capitalism, it steals profit from labor. So this is a measure of how much profit you're stealing from labor. Whoever that third company is, Bernie Sanders should give them the Karl Marx Good Communist Award. <laughs> that third company is all of these 22 companies combined. It is, it is every restaurant, retail, supermarket, and pharmacy in the Fortune 500 combined. Look at those names. Walmart, Target, Darden, Yum, CVS, Walgreens, combined to make that $36 billion. Well, hold on a minute, Joe. Some of those people are part-time. Okay. Assume only half are full-time. Then your full-time profit per employee is $12,600. Assume only 25% are full-time. Then your full-time profit per employee is 25,200, still a fraction of what's made in other industries. We're trying to get legislators to understand this is not a question of compassion, it's a question of mathematics. This is why you can't make working the cash register at McDonald's a job that supports a head of household. So as government, and as we think about how we advocate, if the answer is just, well, we can't afford it, I'm not sure some of our opponents really care, right? So the question is, what are we going to do to, to develop the proper policies for how government should interact at a time when the opportunities to get into the middle class are shrinking for people without the right skills and education. Now, we, could, we need to certainly retool our educational system, but that's going to take some time. All right? 
So we need to change how our industry is viewed because our industry is one that has traditionally provided a path to the middle class for people without those advanced degrees, right? An assistant manager of a full service restaurant makes forty to fifty thousand dollars a year. You can do it before the age of twenty five and you don't need a college degree. A general manager makes eighty to hundred thousand dollars a year. You can do it before the age of thirty without a college degree. In addition to being one of the few industries left that's providing employment to those 16 to 19 year olds. Now, I, I gave you those statistics on 16 to 19 year olds. What I didn't tell you is there are 5 million young people in this country, 16 to 24 years old, who are disconnected. That means they're not in school and they're not working. One in five African American young people in this country, disconnected, not in school and not working. This is a serious problem. If somebody's going to ship them all to Google and make them software engineers, that's great, but I don't think that's the plan. So we really need to have a more holistic approach of if government is going to ask us to do more, I get that, but they've got to help us in other ways. And that's why our advocacy needs to be, in my view, more strategic and holistic about, okay, if you're going to do this to us here, you've got to help us over here because of this math. Not because we have any moral right to anything better, it's the math, okay? So, that's what I'm trying to do, um, and I'd be happy to take any questions.